Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 759 of the Juicebox podcast. Jenny Smith is back, and today we are doing another In the Bold Beginning series. Today's topic is interesting. There were a ton of questions that all revolved around guilt, fears, hope, and expectations. So Jenny and I just sort of sat back and had a a conversation about those ideas. We worked in the questions from you, the listeners, and we shared our own, I don't know, remembrances of different things that we thought might help you get more comfortable with type 1 diabetes. I appreciate if you consider going to t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox and completing the survey. That's it. I won't give you a big thing. You hear about it every day on the podcast. t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox. Completing the survey will take fewer than 10 minutes. It'll help a bunch of people, including you, me, and other people with type 1. t1dexchange.org forward slash juicebox. And if you want to hire Jenny, she works at integrateddiabetes.com. Type that into your browser. Go find out about Jenny. The Omnipod 5 automated insulin delivery system is here, and they're the sponsor of today's episode. If you'd like to learn more or get started with Omnipod 5, go to omnipod.com forward slash juice box. The podcast is also sponsored today by InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. The InPen is an insulin pen that has much of the functionality of insulin pumps. To learn more and get started, go to inpentoday.com. Jenny, we're just going to do one big thing today, and that's it. Awesome. All right. So for the Bold Beginnings series, which, by the way, I'm starting to see feedback about online, which is very exciting. People are are finding it. Hopefully it's yay feedback. (laughs) Do you think if it was bad feedback, I would have brought it up while we were recording another I hope not. (laughs) Well, you know, you have to give honest feedback. People would really like to hear a little more about this or uh, I didn't really agree with that or whatever. You know, honesty is important. (laughs) That made me laugh. I I mean, I would have that conversation. I'm going to be honest in front of people. I would have that conversation with you privately. Privately. (laughs) People hate us. Oh, my God. I'm getting (laughs) feedback and really no one likes us. I didn't realize. But... (laughs) The people are finding it useful in the way that we intended. So that's perfect. Very exciting, actually. So today we're going to hit, this one doesn't seem like fun at all. It's a Monday morning. But uh, this one is is titled Guilt, Fears, Hope, and Expectations. And there are a lot of... uh, Questions or mostly like comments? Well, let's dig right in and find out. I'm sure it's both, honestly. So I think... You know, I don't even want to give my opinion yet. Like, let's just talk. So the first person said that they that they experienced immediate grief around diagnosis. Just immediately, like like a loss had happened. I've talked about this on the podcast before. I've tried to have therapists on to talk about how you manage grief um, mm-hmm. because I don't know from a technical standpoint, but. It's so strange, isn't it? We just talked about this before we were recording a second yes, ago. Yes, we did. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll say it here while we we're recording. There is a reaction that you have when you get bad health news. And bad health news that isn't going to get cured. You know, it's not like, wow, you have the flu. Just try not to die for six days and you'll be okay again. Right. Like, right. Like yes. that kind of stuff. There was when Arden, you'll go back to being the tennis pro or whatever. <laughs> yeah, you right? go. You'll, you'll go back to your life. This is all going to be fine. But when Arden right. was diagnosed, I remember just thinking, "Oh, well, we're not going to have the life I thought we were going to have." Right. Mm-hmm. Like, like, and then over time, that you realize that diabetes isn't as difficult as you imagine it's going to be. Hopefully, if you get some things figured out, and that it's not, it's not. Um, I don't know. For, for for us, at least, it's not like somebody chained Arden to a, a post and we couldn't get her off again. Correct. We, you know, we had to just live our life here in this little space. But it still is true that we're not living the life 
that like when Arden came out and we were like, look, we have a baby, like in our Simba <laughs> moment, you know what I mean? We were right. Like, oh, yes. we're, kind of down. we're holding the baby up and oh, on the hill. Uh, this is not what I thought was going to happen. <laughs> and so you, um, I think that's the loss. I think, mm -hmm. that, I don't know what you think though, because you were diagnosed at a different time at a different age. I was. And I don't, I don't know that I so much had a sense of loss as a sense of significant change. Mm -hmm. um, when I was diagnosed in, in the hospital, the nurse educator was very quick to tell me I could do mostly anything that I wanted to do. What she told me I couldn't do, she said, was very limited and boiled down to essentially being it was something like a bus driver, a pilot, and I couldn't be in the military. Mm -hmm. She's like, so think of all the things that you really like doing and might want to do at this you know, age that you're at and realize that you can still do all of these things. And I was like, well... I probably was never, I was not thinking about being a pilot. I wasn't thinking about being a bus driver or, you know, whatever. So I just felt like, okay, I guess I just have to do these additional things. So my personal sense wasn't so much of a, obviously I didn't feel guilty. I mean, right. yeah. I didn't have anything to feel guilty about. I'd have to ask my mom if she had any guilt or my dad felt any, they'd never voiced it if they, if they did, but that guilt and sense of loss, I hear a lot of that right. in the families that I work with. Um, and it it can stick around. Yeah. So, it, yeah, uh, for me, I was a stay-at-home dad at that point. And they, we, we pretty quickly, even though we didn't understand the link between Coxsackie virus and maybe mm -hmm. being diagnosed, and even at the moment in the beginning, I didn't understand that Arden had, you know, markers that made her more likely to get type one. I didn't understand any of that at that time. Right. But I did see anecdotally, she was sick. She had this Coxsackie virus and now she has diabetes. And I beat myself up pretty hard about that. Cause I kept thinking like, did I not wash her hands? Did I not wash my hands? Did, right. did I, I take, expose her some way that could have been prevented? I kept thinking I took her to the wrong place. Like, like, did I get in my car one day and drive to this place for lunch instead of that place for lunch? And that's why Arden got Coxsackie virus. And now we're here at right. this hospital in Virginia. Like, you, you know, like, right. and as it, it's crazy because it's twofold. It, it's not something you can control. And it's obviously not something you have vision for that you could have not done. But yet there's that part of your brain that goes, if you would have zigged instead of zagged, maybe this didn't happen. And it's hard not to feel that. It's almost like, do you ever have a car accident and think if I would have just left 30 seconds sooner, this wouldn't have happened? Yes. You know? Absolutely. Right. Yes. I've only ever had one car accident in Good my life. You. I was coming home from, from college and the, the roads were clear, except you know what black ice is, black right? Black ice, yes. So driving home and instead of taking the highway highway, I took a road that cut some of my time off. And it was more of like, let's call it a, a country road, right? Um, I mean, it was paved. It wasn't like weird backcountry or anything, mm -hmm. right? But I had this little Renault Alliance. That was my very first car. <laughs> and <laughs> the back tires hit this patch that I I thought was snow because it was like lightly covered. Right. And I dashed like across the other side of, of the street and across the ditch. I hit a mailbox and I ended up in somebody's backyard. Wow. So, yes, I, I did. And at that point, I was like, well, had I just like slowed down when I saw that snowy patch in the road, right. knowing Wisconsin weather and whatever, but you can't go back. No, you just have to be like, okay, now I'm more aware at this point. I realized I yelled black ice out of context. When Kelly and I were very young, she would tell me all the time, be careful of black ice. And one day we were driving. And I just started to wiggle the steering wheel, and I yelled, "Black ice!" And she panicked. And <laughs> oh no, there, there was no back. I'm now that wondering. Was a mean joke. Yeah, Scott. I'm now wondering how we're together. Uh, how she didn't just like <laughs> like say like pull over and let me out now, you idiot. Uh, right. so, <laughs> I'm done. You know, it's funny you were talking about the things that the doctor told you or the the you know the mm -hmm. educator told you you couldn't do, and you're like, oh, no problem. I, I don't want to be these things anyway. 
Have you ever heard the lady that came on the show whose husband was a fighter pilot, I think, and the person told her kid when the kid was diagnosed, don't worry, the only thing you can't do is fly a jet. And mm-hmm. it's the only thing the kid wanted to do because his dad does it, you, right. you know. And of course, you know. I think even in that conversation, the woman's like that poor lady. Like she was like so sure she was going to reinforce to my kid that you can do anything. Like there's this one simple thing you can't do. And, you can't do, and that's exactly what it was. Yeah, they wanted, to, what do. He wanted to do. I know. So, uh, so it takes me into these next couple of statements. People said I, I really needed a lot of hope in the early days. And that is what people are trying to do when they say, don't worry, there's only three things you, you know, et cetera, or you'll live a normal life. You just have to count your, I think, I think oddly that so much of the poor management information that people get in the beginning stems from someone trying to be kind to them. Does that make sense? It like, does. Like, don't Making worry, you just count it- your carbs and do like, they're trying to make it seem easy. Yes. Right. And yes. maybe that's the maybe that's the only thing you can do in that spot. I don't know. I no, I would agree. It's, and it especially boils down to the one comment that I think is it's hard to understand once you get further into understanding management mm-hmm. is the food tied one. You can just you can eat anything, just take your insulin. Right. right? And that is, it's a way to tell somebody. Not much has to change. Look, you can keep doing everything that you have been doing. You have to just add these little extras into the picture. Mm -hmm. And there's supposed to be a sense of relief. Like, thank goodness I can keep, you know, eating whatever it was for lunch that I love to eat. But it doesn't take away from the feeling of the additional things Mm-hmm. that are really big additional things yeah. that we're teaching somebody they now have to do. These next couple of statements, um, kind of, they kind of hinge together a little bit. This one person said they kept hoping the doctors were wrong. Like they sent yeah. them home. I hear that a lot from people. Um, I only went through it for a day. And I know Arden had some sort of crazy honeymoon day, which I look back now and think probably wasn't even a honeymoon. She just really just didn't need insulin this one day. Right. Right. Like, they were wrong. And I know they were wrong. I immediately was, I called my friend who's her pediatrician. I was like, hey, she hasn't needed insulin all day. I think they're wrong. And he was mm-hmm. so sad. He was like, oh, Scott, like she has, she has type one. She's like, he's like, this will change. Like, just keep watching, you know? Yeah. And um, there's that. And there's this other part here. This person said that there was so much confusion in the doctor's office. And looking back, the way she sees it is, They weren't a thousand percent sure the kid had diabetes, but they were sure. And she said, I just kept seeing the the medical people looking at each other and nodding and kind of like talking to each other with their faces, but not saying anything out loud to me. She said she found it very scary, like just in that space. And scary in terms of, are they confused? Are they actually the right people that I should be talking to? Mm -hmm. I mean- Really, you don't want a confused look or these exchanges of eye movement, facial expression between what you're thinking is an educated professional to get an opinion or a diagnosis from. You just want the direct information. Tell me what you think it is. What are you going to do to prove that it is or is not this? Yeah. It's, Just be honest. It's super interesting that I'm going to tell you something personal that has nothing to do with diabetes. My mom's blood pressure started to go up the, a few days ago. So I get a, a message from her. Hey, Scott, my blood pressure has been high the last couple of days. I call the nurse where she's living. I'm talking to the nurse. And um, I said, hey, my mom's blood pressure has been f- high for four days now. What are we doing? And she said, oh, the doctors gave her a little more medication. We're waiting to see if that worked. And I was like, well, what else are we doing? You know, are we just going to keep medicating her until, you know, I was like, right. And and she says, so I want to get this word for word. She says, well, your mom has a heart condition and those don't get better. They just get worse. And all I could think was, what in the hell are you thinking saying that to me? Like, like, you don't know me. Like I took it. I was like, yeah, I know. Like, but like, that doesn't mean we're giving up on her. Right. Like, 
she could see the cardiologist, couldn't she? You know? Right. But I, I, all I could think afterwards was like the lack of bedside manner in that statement is fascinating. Absolutely. She was like, hey, what do you want us to do? Right. Like, <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> something. Could you do something? You, you, you know, it's just, it was, I, I just couldn't believe that it occurred to her to speak like that. Absolutely. And I think what we've lost actually, not everybody, but I think what there is a loss of in healthcare is a sense of being human. Mm. Right? It's a sense of how would I want this presented to me? Yeah. Imagine you're the person sitting there. And I think doctors, you know, and or other clinicians, not just doctors in general, but other clinicians have become so very just blunt, for lack of a better word, mm. about this is it. And no, it's not going to get better. Well, you may want that information eventually. And you may actually sort of know that. You you may understand that as an adult, especially. Yeah. But to have somebody so very cut and dry be like, nope, this is it. And this is this isn't going to get any better. I mean that, put a little bit of empathy in that rather than just being so uh, yeah. Jenny, <laughs> I, I, I don't want her to lie to me, but no. <laughs> there had to have been a few better ways to say that. <laughs> Correct. You know? I mean, even to be able to say, well, we're going to use these types of medications. And as you understand, um, the medications, we may need to, to titrate, we may need to change them. As things change with this type of a health condition, we do know that it doesn't typically heal. And so we're going to have to try things to keep your mom comfortable, to keep her feeling well enough, but it will progress. Yeah. I mean, I think that was much nicer than the way that you're talking. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I, I fascinated. Anyway, uh, so there's a balance between being told the truth and being slapped in the face with some horror. Yes. That there's better ways to talk about. And I don't know. Right. It, it, there's a well, and I think, there. as you say, slapped in the face kind of with a diagnosis, oftentimes in a very, emer um, you know, emergency type of <sighs> diagnosis for type one. Many times it's not that somebody's caught symptoms early enough and just come into the peds office or to their typical primary care doctor and say, yeah, I'm not feeling so great. Could we you know, do some tests and have some discussion and whatever? Many times it's very emergent. And then like mine, I went to the emergency room and I was right there when the doctor told my mom and myself what was wrong. Yeah, There, there was no like time in a nice room right, someplace right, with like yeah. birds outside the window I'm just saying to be, look at just be human that's all like just yes. th that that that's all i'm looking for from anybody i'm going to read this person's statement it's pretty big the omnipod 5 is the only tubeless automated insulin delivery system that integrates with the dexcom g6 cgm and uses smart adjust technology to automatically adjust your insulin delivery every five minutes, helping to protect against highs and lows without multiple daily injections. Omnipod 5 is currently cleared for people with type 1 diabetes, ages 6 and older, and you have the option to control it all from a compatible smartphone. Omnipod 5 is also available through the pharmacy, which means you can get started without the four-year durable medical equipment contract that comes with most insulin pumps even if you're currently in warranty with another system. Wink, wink, you know what I'm saying? You can switch. To get started with Omnipod 5, go to omnipod.com forward slash juice box. If you're not ready for an automated insulin delivery system, go check out the Omnipod Dash, a wonderful pump, just not automated. And you can do that at my link as well, omnipod.com forward slash juice box. You may be eligible for a free 30-day trial of the Omnipod Dash. Did you know that? Full, well, it's true. For full safety, risk information, and free trial terms and conditions, you can also visit Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. Now, if you just don't want an insulin pump, but you also don't want to just be using needles or a, just a regular old pen, you should consider the InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. The InPen has some of the functionality that you come to expect with an insulin pump. I'd like to tell you about it right now. But first, let me tell you this, inpentoday.com. 
Okay, now, now that you remember the link, inpentoday.com, I'll tell you about the inpen. So with the inpen, you get the pen, and you get an app. Now, here's the thing about the pen. Terms and conditions apply, but it's possible that you'll pay as little as $35 for the inpen. That offer is available to people with commercial insurance. You should go check it out. While you're there, take a look at this. Impen offers 24-hour technical support, hands-on product training, and online educational resources. The Impen is an insulin pen, but it does more. For instance, it has a dosing calculator, reminds you of when doses are due, carb counting support, and a digital logbook. It also has an activity log, meal history, your current glucose, a dosing calculator, active insulin remaining, glucose history, and reports for you and your doctor. Pretty cool, huh? If you're ready to try it, head over to inpentoday.com. There's a, a form there. It just asks you for your name and your phone number and tell them what kind of insurance you have, like private insurance, government insurance. Click submit. Somebody gets right back to you. It's pretty easy and pretty cool. Inpentoday.com. So whether you're looking for an insulin pump, an insulin pen, glucagon, a Dexcom, the contour, next one, blood glucose meter, whatever you're looking for, check out my links. They're available at juiceboxpodcast.com or they're in the show notes of your audio app. When you click on my links, you're supporting the podcast and you're being connected with quality, quality devices and products. I'm going to get you back to Jenny now. Thank you for listening to the ads. InPen requires a prescription and settings from your healthcare provider. You must use proper settings and follow the instructions as directed, or you could experience high or low glucose levels. For more safety information, visit InPenToday.com. I felt an incredible grief. We had no family history of diabetes. It was a surprise, and I was extremely scared. On the way from the urgent care to the hospital, following an ambulance that my daughter was in, uh, or excuse me, followed by her ambulance ride, my daughter asked what diabetes was. And she said, I was like, it's sort of like being allergic to sugar and you need shots. I didn't know mm -hmm. a lot, she said. She said, I wept all night uh, when she wasn't looking. I thought, I can't do this. I really just can't do this. She said, I wanted to, I wanted someone to come and give me a hug to validate my feelings and my fears, but also to tell me that this was going to be okay, that she could live a great life, um, and that I would be able to do it. A lot of parents have learned to manage well, and you can too. She said, I would have, it would have been great if somebody could have said that to me. Um, yeah. She can still do everything you hope, et cetera, and so on. I would have liked someone to tell me that the next few days were going to be hard and that it would involve sleep deprivation. Mm. Um, it would have felt good to know that I could have done it one step at a time, maybe one day at a time, that I could have found a Facebook group, that I could have shared my struggles with somebody else, that somebody else might have known the difference. Um, sure. Yeah. And I think some of that also ties into the rapid nature of discharge upon a diagnosis like this. I mean, in today's world, unless unless there's something really detrimental within that diagnosis and they really have to keep you for many, many, many days. Mm -hmm. Most often it's an in, you might be there one, two nights and you are out and you get rapid fire information. First, you get a diagnosis that you had no idea even what it was many times. And now you're getting education, if you will, and you're getting information about all of these things that you're going to have to do. Again, the factors of life changing become like a quick like knock on the head. Yeah. Here you go. All these things. You know, when I I I think that when I was diagnosed, I was in the hospital for an entire week. And day after day there were new things brought in different pieces of education in a nature that I could swallow and my parents could swallow because it wasn't all rapid fire. Yeah. I have a note so, here from a person that just, I just randomly got this note a couple of days ago and just says, Hey Scott, thanks for everything. You've helped me more in two days than anyone else helped me in the last 20 years. And what I responded back oh. to her was, I was like, well, that's really wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm glad that the podcast is helping you, but 
I didn't have to tell you those things while you were sitting in the hospital and it still felt like somebody hit you in the head with a frying pan. You, you True. Know, like I got to tell you when you were relaxed and at home and And I think in a different way, though, like there's a slap in the face with something that you never expected. Again, a type one diagnosis or a type two diagnosis or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever. But then there's a slap in the face kind of with. Well, darn, this information's been around. Why didn't I have access to it? Why did nobody told me about this? Nobody told me I could do this way um, or use this product or whatever. So I think they're. They're similar but different enough that yeah. you've been already navigating through something, and now you're a little bit more irritated. Yeah, you're hers, like, well, why, why did nobody tell me this? Her, hers has another layer, and that definitely is that, you know, if she would have found the podcast, you know, six weeks after she was diagnosed, she'd be like, all right, cool, six weeks. I didn't understand what I was doing. 20 years is hard because you start doing that reverse math. You're like, I've done damage to my body now that I can't get out of, and you're telling me this right. all existed and just no one told me about it. Right. So there, it's a strange balance. Um, how do I explain type one diabetes to a three year old? Mm. And I mean, I don't know. I don't think you can. So what did you do right? with? I mean, Arden was two, right? Yeah. She was. How two. did you guys talk to her about it? You look her in the face and you say, I'm sorry. I have to give you this needle. And you try not to cry. <laughs> like, like, I mean, what else are you going to do, right? Like, it's she's two or three years old in this in this person situation. Well, what are you going to say? Like, correct. What, I mean, what are they going to understand? Hi, I, and that's you know, where you have to look at is the understand level. Yeah, I mean, eventually we told her there's a thing inside of her body that makes the stuff inside of this needle. It's not making it anymore, and she needs it, and so we're going to give it to her this way. And right. she then saw the needle put a big smile on her face and ran away from us. <laughs> She's like, yeah, ah! and took off. <laughs> you right. know, she just told me two nights ago, we were sitting around online, Googling what are people's biggest fears and guessing people's top fears, like by state, by country. It was actually kind of interesting. Yeah. And, and she said, Oh, this is one of mine. And so we're all like trying to guess what it is. And she's like needles. She's like, I'm afraid of needles. And she's like, I really don't like needles. And um, huh. I'm going to try to get her on the podcast soon to talk about it. But Arden's only ever given herself one shot. One. And it because was. Because you did it for such a long time. And then we as switched a to a pump. pump. And we switched to a pump when she was four. And right. she gave herself one recently because she's going to school. And I was like, listen, you're going to hit a spot at some point while you're at school. Where you're going to have to clear something. You're going to need an injection. Here, do this one. And I- I'll let her tell the story. But. She, uh, I think she took the better part of 90 minutes to put the, to put the needle in her thigh. Like she yeah. had to go into a private room by herself and like psych herself up to do it. But if you take her, to, she gets blood draws constantly. Sure. Hates them, but has to watch it happen. And somebody else is doing it though. Yes. But she stares at it. She, right. I'm like, Arden, look away. She goes, I need to see it happen. And yeah. I'm like, all right. I, I don't even know how to explain that that thing right so right and it's not just as simple as nobody wants to get stuck with a needle because nobody wants to get stuck with a needle but she really she hates it you know yeah but how do you explain it to a three-year-old i don't know like i think the best thing i can say is that after a while it just becomes commonplace and a three-year-old doesn't remember five months ago the first day you were like here give me your arm you know right well, and this. as you teach kids anything, I think I think parents who are very verbal in explanation about we're going to do this because of this, mm-hmm. like I'm going to go outside and I'm going to mow the lawn because the lawn is long and it needs to be cut. And, you know, we don't want bugs growing in our backyard or whatever it is. I mean, at a level that a kid can understand, and then you continue to progress through as kids grow, you keep explaining more and more. And oftentimes they end up coming back to you with the endless flood of questions that over the age of like four comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And as they ask more, you get a little bit deeper in, I guess, explanation, but you you do have to start at a really like dumbed down level. Yeah. And you build on it. Yes. You really do. Because, I mean, even even saying 
there's something inside of your body that makes this stuff, but it's not working anymore. I don't even know if there's context for that, really. Wait, there's stuff inside my body? You, you, right. you know what I mean? Like, what? Like, this is because right. for, for a young person, you're you. You're this the visage that you see out front. You're not your intestines right. and your, and you know. If the child is interested in books already and you read often, there are a lot of really good kid-based books that are all different levels of Explaining age yeah. to be able to start with in explanation. Um, and I, I guess I would probably start there. Yeah. And I think understanding that it's not like you're you're not talking to a friend. You're not going to explain no. it to them right now and they're just going to get it. It's going to be like a process. And, you know, mm -hmm. you have to be patient with it. This person said, will my child live a normal life? I know the answer to that now, but I absolutely did not know then. So we covered that. Um, this person said what you said earlier, that the simplest advice is still incredibly difficult to comprehend in the early days. Um, it would have been great if somebody would have explained a honeymoon to me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that there's one. How about this one? Will I ever sleep again? They just talked about checking every two hours with no end date and did not discuss CGMs with me at the time. And that's so. where with today's technology, you as the parent or caregiver, you go back and you say, you do realize that not only have you loaded me with this thing, not you, you know, by decision, but mm -hmm. you've given me this thing to now help me manage for my child. You're telling me I have to do this. I know that this technology is available. You will you will write a prescription for this, right. right? I mean, you will give this to me. There is no reason not to. If I have the ability to sleep, I can make better decisions with all the things you told me to keep track of in the day for my child. But yeah, but think about what she said. Like, you're, we're going to check every two hours. Oh, there I go. Overnight too? Yeah. Well, what? <laughs> you know? Right. And then there are some, Absolutely. Then there's some doctors who used to say, don't worry. Over, like, it's very important to check during the day. But overnight, don't worry about it. I was like, well, because that's what I was told. And I was like, how the hell is that reasonable? Like, uh, they like, told you to not check overnight? Yeah, if overnight was fine. But during the day, you need to check. And I was really? like, yeah. And then I stopped and I didn't do that. And that's how I, well, at first I listened to them. And then eventually I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. And then, right. you know, that's how I learned that I was putting Arden to bed at like 180 blood sugar. She was waking up at 90 and I thought I was doing great until I checked overnight and saw she was like 58 at some points. Right. And, like, I, didn't I mean, know that's that. very similar to being like your newborn baby needs to nurse every two to three hours or get a bottle every two to three hours. But at night, go ahead and sleep. Not when you're Don't tired. Don't worry about though. it. They'll be fine until you wake yeah. up at nine o'clock the next morning. Yeah, yeah. That kid, <laughs> that's that, the same concept. That's exactly right. And it, it freaked me out I when I figured it out. Um, it would have been nice, this person says, if a medical person would have just talked to me like a human being. And this next person says, the favorite thing that an endocrinologist told me early on, you see this, people say this all the time online, but there's two things you can no longer eat, poison and poison cupcakes, is what they told they me. Call. Yeah, um, <laughs> yes. it made us realize we could do what we needed to do and succeed. Um, the mental load of it all, for me, uh, my my son was four at diagnosis, and I was able to work from home with him until we became more stable with our sugars. Um, mm -hmm. And that helped her with her the mental strain, just taking mm -hmm. another thing away in life and being able to focus more on that. We got right. super lucky. I was a stay-at-home dad already. Already, so, yeah. Know, well, could... and I think about, especially in this, I have a number of single parents, you know, single, really single, like there is no other mm -hmm. um person, father or mother caregiver involved and or just the sharing families, right? Sometimes you're with mom, sometimes you're with dad, sometimes you're with grandma and grandpa or whatever it might be. And um, in a diagnosis setting where there really is only one caregiver, now you have added, when you talk about things changing, mm -hmm. you've added another layer of change that they may already be pretty overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, no. So, it, it's it, not everybody is in my situation where I was like, "Oh, well, I don't have a job. I have plenty of time to figure this out." Right? You know, right. I tell people all the time they 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 thank me for the podcast. I was like, "Thank my wife. Like she made enough money when we were younger that I didn't have to work, and that's part of my free time. It was 
around figuring out diabetes. I wouldn't right. call it free time like you think of, but you know. R- right. Yeah, when I, when I wasn't <laughs> it wasn't like you were baking cupcakes for the neighborhood, yeah, right? I was like, oh, you know what I'll do with my free time. But I mean, I, <laughs> I wasn't at work where I had to disconnect myself from my family's problems so I could get a thing done so I could con- collect a right. paycheck, you know. Uh, this person said, I needed somebody to tell me it wasn't my fault repeatedly in the beginning. Um, here, this is interesting. We just talked about needle fear. And I, so I kind of want to come back around to this for a second. This person saying needle fear was really tough for my kid. Um, they figured it out. It's no big deal now, et cetera. There's this thing that I did that I believe is worked for us. And I think it's worth people paying attention to because in the beginning, you can do this thing where you're like, well, we'll use a numbing cream. We'll get a buzzy. We're going to do mm-hmm. this. We'll do that. We're going to make it easier. Oh, it's time for your shot. Not yet. Okay, buddy, let's wait. Like, I am more of the school of like, draw the insulin, stick it in, push the thing, do get it. over with. Like, it, we're not going to like this one way or the other. You right. know what I mean? Don't draw it out. Let's not draw it out. I just, I learned that lesson very early on when I think my wife and I spent an hour and a half in the middle of the night trying to get my son to swallow a pill. <laughs> mm-hmm. He'd be just like, swallow the pill. Just take the pill. <laughs> Please take right. the pill. And he's like, I don't want to. Hold on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> you, you know, like it's the, it was that I'm just – Arden used to wait a minute. I was like, Arden, let's just do it fast and get it over with. Yep. And just get it done. I mean, you'll find what works for you, but I think dragging it out just extends the panic because it goes away when it's over. You it th- does. Yeah. You know Absolutely. What I mean? It's even like an argument, you know, with a five-year-old, essentially. If you're having an argument – And you can tell that you're continuing to get more irritated because they're just not listening to you. It's better as the adult to Mm -hmm. to literally just be like, I'm stepping away. I've told you what needs to be told to you. We're not doing it for this reason. And I'm going to go over here. Yeah. And you can just sit Mm -hmm. because there's, you know, so just deal with it now. Get it over with and move on. You also have a lot more time in your day left. This one person says, I was 39 when I was diagnosed, and I kept thinking, what did I do wrong? Mm. And she said, or he said, excuse me, one or the other, um, I still, they said that their mental health is still not where it was before they were diagnosed. And they just just don't know what to do about it. And speaking of not knowing what to do about it, this, uh, this next person says, how do you deal with overwhelming emotions? I've never had them before. And... Yeah. Now here they are. I don't know what to do and I don't know where to get help and, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the mental health piece of diabetes management, both for caregivers as well as the person living with diabetes, um, thankfully has gotten more attention, if you will, in the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. But I think it's still well at the bottom of pile in terms of discussion and asking, how are you doing with all of this? You know, what kinds of things are you doing to to have joy and to still feel good and to do as much as you can back to the normal, whatever normal is, right? Um, I mean, there are there are quite a number of um mindfulness and meditative types of things that you can kind of do to get back to letting your brain at least work through things in a way that doesn't make you continue to feel stressed all the time. Um, But you have to look for the resources, right? Nobody hands something to you like that at diagnosis. Right. Well, there's a question I ask a lot when I'm interviewing people and they have really heavy stories. You know, people who are like, five, six medical conditions, like a lot of stuff going on, whatever. And they get done. And I try to remember to say to them, hey, are you okay? You know, like, because I also try to make my interviews fun. And like, you're talking about these really serious things and trying to keep it lighthearted. And then I'm like, are you all right? I'm frequently surprised by the number of people who don't know if they're okay or not. Or not. They can't say. They. It's not that they don't want to tell you they're not okay. It's that they, they don't even consider if they're okay like it's not a concern of theirs they they can i guess they compartmentalize everything to the degree where they don't ever consider yeah at all yeah you know i I, i've had people i'm like just take your time think about it are you all right Mm -hmm. they they can't say you you know and that's that to me seems like 
emotions. And they're not are, okay. Yeah. And they're not dealt with emotions. They don't even know how to like put words to them, you know? Right. Right. Um, just, and I think some of that might come from trying to bring down emotion around diabetes management, yeah, make it, right? Yep. To be able to just see the numbers as numbers and information and be able to navigate through them and move on, right? right. But a lot of that is taking a piece out that is part of being a human, mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah, so it can go too far in terms of well, I don't really even know how to analyze whether I feel good or not. Or I don't think I should think about this because I don't I might fall apart if I think about it. Right. And so everybody's just trying to. But I think you're right. Like there's you, whatever your situation is. And I'm certainly not. I mean, some people's situations are much more manageable than others. But that is your situation. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not changing. So you have to accept it and then put your head down and keep going. And right. I guess maybe for some people putting their head down and keep going is I can't think about this because, Hey, cause it's, yeah, I'm 39 years old and my pancreas stopped working. Are you okay? I think the answer is no, I'm not okay. This is right. Fucking terrible. Right. You know, like, and, and there's no, the doctor said they can't fix it and it's not going to go away. So how am I supposed to be okay? And the answer is, I think you have to change your perspective about what okay is. Right. Does that make sense? You yes. know what I mean? Because in the beginning of life, everything just feels free. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to do this right. and it's going to be fine. And if it doesn't, I'll go do something else. It doesn't right. matter to me. It doesn't really hit you the first time till school when you're, if if the idea of getting good grades is important to you, because then suddenly you're like, uh oh, I'm being measured. Right. Yeah. And then you become an adult and you get measured again because you want to stay safe and secure and fed. So you got to find a job. And then, oh, everything's not so easy. But then you fall into that and you're like, hey, all right, I'm an adult. I'm doing it. I got a place to live. Television works. You know what I mean? I got right. my vitamins. I'm good. Here's the next problem and it's medical. Mm -hmm. And then, no, no, it's not okay. I didn't want this to happen to me. I, I mean, so well, and medical, I think, is really it's one that may or may not have a quick solution to it right. or a fix to it at all. It's something that you learn to navigate with, but it's not like I'm not okay because my tire went flat on my car. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this is a situational not okay. <laughs> This isn't a long term. I need to learn how to accept and move forward and realize that this will be here. I know that some days are going to be great, like I want them, and other days are going to be cruddy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think it's important to know that you are going to go through a lot of the stages of grief, which, you know, you can look up online. There's different doctors who think of them differently, but, you know, shock, disbelief, denial, bargaining, guilt, anger, depression, acceptance, hope, like, that stuff is, it's all going to hit you, mm -hmm. um, and it should. This one's interesting. Do you know why they call it diabetes? Do you have any idea? I'm asking you if you know, like where the yeah, name came it comes from. from the I mean, diabetes in and of itself, there are several, obviously, kinds of diabetes in mm -hmm. terms of the end. Like the diabetes we have is diabetes mellitus or mellitus or, you know, whatever, yeah. how you say that, that last term. Um, in terms of just diabetes, um, it, there are Latin terms essentially that go along with it, which is the reason for so th it. This person's statement makes me think that it sh we should call it livabetes because yeah. she said her six-year-old said, why is it diabetes? That's how the kid heard it. So she thought, I'm going to die because I got diabetes. And <laughs> she's six and she's six and, you know. Uh, well, that's it is kind of cruddy. I mean, actually, it's something my husband said to me a long time ago when we were like doing the diabetes anniversary or the diversary or whatever. He's like, why are we not calling this livabetes? Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't die right away. He's yeah. like, in fact, you you move forward along with it. You're living. So what's right. the, and, even, you know, of even, course, then I'm like, well, here's the Latin meaning. Here's the everything. Latin meaning. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So it's, um, I, I guess Isabel did a very good job grouping these questions together for me because I have I just keep thinking, wow, it's amazing. They all just relate to each other as I go down the list, but now I realize she did this for me. So Did she? Uh, yeah, oh, that was nice. Because this next one is not pleasant, but this, this, this person said, my baby was diagnosed. 
And everything felt like death to me. She's like, well, is sugar going to kill her? Am I going to kill her with insulin? Is this pump going to kill her? Will this CGM kill her? She said death just rang through her head in the beginning. Um, yes. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's um. there's probably a good spot here for us to point out that Jenny's living very well <laughs> with diabetes. And so are a lot of other people. Um, many, many yeah. other people absolutely are. Yes. But I, 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 we're doing this as part of this series because these are very likely the things that are going to run through your head when this all happens. And I think that should you not go find a therapist or should you not go find an online group, that it would be very helpful to know that there was another person who thought, I'm going to kill everybody. I thought I was going to kill right. Arden constantly in the sure. beginning. Everything I did, I was like, this is definitely going to kill her. Like, just, you know. Right. I, I just, I'm going to give this to her, and uh, I don't know that it's right, and I'm yeah. just going to, it's is, not going to end well. This is it, Lunch wasn't lunch anymore. Lunch was just like, I wonder if I didn't screw this up, is how it felt. You, you know, and then, you know, a couple of hours later, she was still looking at me. I was like, hey. Yay! Yay. <laughs> it was, this was a win. I didn't. Yeah, exactly. It is. You know, I, I haven't thought about it in quite a while, though. Though the question about the word diabetes, mm -hmm. I really haven't. I mean, the the first part of it has nothing to do with death right. at all. Dia, um, diabetes really just means a passing through or a siphoning, right? Mm -hmm. And mellitus or mellitus means sweet. So it's they tested eons ago when we had nothing. Doctors would literally dip their fingers in like a person's urine and taste it. And if it was sweet, they knew that they had this like sugar sugar sickness or honey sickness. Right. Um, and so. you also knew your doctor really cared about you. Because. Yes, <laughs> tasting my urine. Yeah. Well, you know, urine's pretty sterile, so well, unless there's like ucky, you know, whatever. How about I don't care, Jenny? <laughs> I, I would not have been a good doctor in that moment. I would have been like, listen, <laughs> we could taste this to see if you have diabetes, but I got to be honest, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so <laughs> go find a friend. Yeah, there's lots of stuff that could be in there. Yeah, and be a good doctor who's like, let's taste this and see what's going on I'm here. Not up for that. Um, this person said to be very careful that they stopped taking care of themselves when they were diagnosed. She said, mm -hmm. I could start, I, 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 there, it got to the point where I could count the times I was showering because I, I was just not taking care of myself anymore. She's like, mm -hmm. I was fighting with my insurance company, calling companies, begging nurses to call me back. She said I was distraught and overwhelmed. And, uh, that's where the, that's how the grief hit her. She kind of just started to let go of, like everyday activities that she would do. Um, right. Better now. Well, and I think it brings in, I mean, that that brings in a layer in terms of what she mentioned, things like calling insurance and fighting for things, right? Mm -hmm. It brings in a piece to that management that is the addition of more. Yeah. Right? More things to keep track of and do. It's not, well, my, you know, medication that I take for, whatever it is, I pick it up once a month and it's okay. And I don't really have to think about it. I don't have to fight the insurance to cover it and whatever. But all these parts that end up coming along with diabetes management in today's world, especially, mm -hmm. mean you may have to have more interaction at times, not necessarily every day, but more interaction at times. And especially in the very beginning, when you are asking your insurance to now, hey, cover this and cover this, and we've got this new diagnosis, and they've got all of, all of these protocols and things that they have to follow within their organization, there's a lot of work up front. Yeah. No, I've yelled the F word into a phone a lot of times in the beginning. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever used no, I that do. word, I used but to, I've, I would, yes. I used to find that it moved things along very nicely. <laughs> I probably said them after I was off yeah. the phone. In, in 2022, I, I'm assuming that this the customer service rep would say that they don't feel like they're in a safe space now and hang up the phone. But <laughs> I, back then, I was like, hey, you don't know how hard this is. Let's go. Right. You know, um, this is interesting. Consequences are real, but I couldn't let that stop me from living my life. The balance. I think mm -hmm. that not being a person with diabetes, I can't be sure. But I think that's got to be a bargain that everyone with diabetes makes every day of their life. Like, where, Absolutely. Right? Right? 
Absolutely. With, with everything. I mean, the consequences, and they're not necessarily saying the consequences are real in terms of, let's say bad versus good. I don't love those words, Mm -hmm. but there can always be a good consequence to your choice. There could also be what you really didn't plan on happening because it just worked out the other way. Right. So this person says, um, the fear of complications from my daughter was my biggest worry. And that's all I saw when I looked things up online. I have to tell you, my brain works that way too. Like, you know, you have an autoimmune disease. There's a likelihood you might have another one at some point. Um, At what point? Your brain goes to the worst. What else could be wrong? Yeah, the worst. What else could happen because of this? Yeah. Which, by the way, you have to guard against because you, you have to make sure to look at all your possibilities as things are happening over your lifetime, but to not just see diabetes all the time too. I see people that happens to them all the time. Like, Hey, my kid's got a headache. What's this got to do with diabetes? And I was like, I mean, I maybe, yeah, maybe the kids just got a headache. I, listen, I don't know. Is your blood sugar bouncing around all over the place? They've been low for a while or high for a while. If those things aside, people get headaches still. People with diabetes Absolutely. get headaches that have nothing to do with their headaches. And it's hard sometimes to separate them. You know, and in in kids, in terms of headaches, I think a big one is hydration. A lot of the time, quite mm-hmm. honestly, and yes, you might see some blood sugars that look funny too. Hydration being a big piece of overall management, but headaches just alone, oftentimes it's drink yeah. some water. I want to I want to offer some comfort to the person who wrote this because they said that they remember thinking that their son would grow up to hate them oh. um, because she saw what she was doing, taking care of him as hurting him. I don't think that's how it it gets remembered. You know what I mean? No. Yeah. I mean, I guess it could, but. It could, I think in, again, that's where some of the discussion goes along with what you're doing, using less of your own like inner thought as you work through doing an injection or changing a pump site or putting, you know, a new sensor on or all those kinds of things that parents are doing. If you talk through it, like, and verbalize it rather than just think it through Mm -hmm. kids absorb and they start to make connections. And with that, I would expect that the child who's hearing their parents say, we have to do this and I'm going to do this. And this is why I'm doing it this way they see it more from a standpoint of caring Mm -hmm. rather than the parent like being mean. Yeah. No, I I think that hopefully over time it it shakes out that way. Yeah. Uh, This next one, I learned the most important thing I learned from the podcast um, is that non-diabetic blood sugars are actually possible. And no one told me that at first, and I did not believe it until I found the podcast. So I'm very glad that that happened for them. I guess they made it onto the Pro Tip series, um, but that's that's lovely that that, that can happen for somebody because I do think that when expectations start getting set up and they start telling you like a seven A one C is fine, don't worry about it, you might start thinking like, oh, I guess, I guess what I used to have with my pancreas isn't going to happen anymore, uh, but it can. Um, just a quick one. Lady yeah. said, uh, I was told that in the beginning it will be hard. And I thought in my mind, oh, that's probably means like two, three weeks <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and not a couple of years or however. I can do this for three weeks. Yeah. I got this. It'll be okay. fine. If it's only going to be three weeks, that'll be okay. Um, yeah. So there's one on here. There's not, there's one that's not on here and I know we're kind of getting up on your time. Am I right? But we're okay for we're okay. a couple minutes. Because yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, this list goes on and on and on and on. Like, I think we've hit the big, um, the big, you know, ideas. Big ones. But here's one that just isn't here. And this is all, this is perspective from me because I'm not a, I'm not a religious person. But I see people talking online all the time. Why did God do this to us? I see a lot or this is going to be okay because God wouldn't give me something I can't handle. And so I don't have a lot of religious perspective and Mm -hmm. I, and I, and I understand that that's how some people might see these things, which is, you know, I have no qualms with, 
But what I can see from a, an outsider's perspective is that sometimes, sometimes I've seen people not pay as close attention to their health because they think God's got it. Yeah. If that's the way to put it, I don't know exactly. Um, and if you believe in God and you think he's on your side or she's on your side or whatever you think, I'm down with that. But just remember, God is not going to bowl us when your kid is 3.30. No. Um, you know, you need to take care of these things. There was just another story recently. I think it was from Australia where these people were put in jail because they let their kid they die. Take their- yeah, yeah. Because they said that God was going to take care of him. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, this is not a commentary about religion to me. It's just you you have to realize you're in a in a a unique situation that is not going to be in any way taken care of without you facilitating it. Correct. Yeah. And I think the bigger thing in in whatever type of faith that you may have, um, most most religions, most faiths have an underlying to God or logos or whatever you Mm -hmm. believe in kind of out there. Um, It gives us movement forward in information and the better we utilize that information for the, for the greater good or for our own health or whatever we have to know that that knowledge, you know, is coming from somewhere. Right. And so I don't think if there is a God, there would be, and I believe in God, Um, (laughs) but I don't, I don't think that God dictates this person gets cancer. This person gets diabetes. This person gets heart disease, that, that type of being, if there is, um, isn't so, cued into person to person on a grander scale, we've been given free choice, right? We've been given the ability to use our brain, to use what we know how to do. Or I don't believe that there would be doctors and engineers and plumbers and, you know, people who are our truck drivers or bus drivers or whatever, you yeah. know, we've decided along a path and we are using our brains to make decisions. And one of those things comes into health management. If you, if you have a child or someone you love, you have to do what is been put out there already Mm -hmm. to be, to use, right? I mean, that's, that's what I believe. I, I think I, in particular from my faith base, I truly believe that there was a reason that I have type one, I believe it's because I had a, I guess, a a destiny, if you will, to be able to use what I've been given to help other people. Mm -hmm. That's what I believe. And I, I don't know. So I hope I'm, I'm hope I'm achieving that. (laughs) No, I I appreciate your perspective very much because I, I honestly don't have one. First of all, I just know that from my, from my perspective, looking onto other people's lives there are times that I want to respond and say, please stop hoping and bolus. Right. Yeah. Like, right. please, I hope, hope. Can you pray for my son? No, none of us need to pray right now. Push the button on the thing. Make the blood sugar go down. Like, like, you know, like that, that kind of thing. Right. I just think sometimes that, that that can get in the way of you making a good decision. And, and so I'm going to, there's a story. I'm going to get it wrong to some degree. I think it's, um, it's something that's been repeated over and over again for years. But guy's walking down the street, falls in a hole. A doctor passes by. The guy shouts up, hey, can I can I get some help here? The doctor writes a prescription, throws it down in the hole. And the guy's like, well, what am I going to do with this? And then, right. you know, a priest comes along and he says, hey, can I get some help? And the priest writes out a prayer and throws it down in the hole. And the guy's like, I can't get out of this hole. And a friend of his walks by and he says, hey, man, can, can I get some help? I'm stuck down in this hole. And the friend jumps in with him and the guy goes, what are you doing? Like now we're both stuck down here. And he goes, no, no, no. I've been down here before and I know the way out. Let me help you. Right. Yeah. So you, you have to accept that help. Right. Right. You can't just, you can't then, you can't just step back and keep saying like, what's the other story, right? Guy lives on a floodplain and uh, somebody comes by and uh, the, the news 
cameras come by and they say, hey, aren't you going to leave, man? There's a flood. You got to go. And the guy's like, no. He's like, you know, God will get me. And the guy's like, I really think you should go. They're saying you should leave here. And then a little while later, a guy comes by on a boat and says, hey, man, get in. There's a flood coming. Let me get you out of here. And the guy goes, no, 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 no. You know, like God's got me. Right. And then eventually the guy's house gets knocked over. He's dead. He looks at God when he opens his eyes. He goes, what happened? The guy's like, look, I sent the reporter with the I weather report. I gave you a whole bunch of help. <laughs> I sent the guy with the boat. You know, I mean, it's an old story, obviously, but you, you really have to. These are just parables because this is how people's minds work. Correct. Right. right? So take the help that's offered to you. And yes. help, go to somebody who knows what they're doing. <clears throat> yeah. Excuse me. Find people who have been through this before. Air how you feel. Don't hold your emotions in. Um, understand you didn't do this. Guilt is, I understand it, but I mean, try to have some long perspective. I, I find that what helps my guilt more than anything is sometimes when I'm talking to a person who's got autoimmune down their family line forever. Mm -hmm. The other day, this woman said to me, oh, my grandmother has, she's achy all the time. I don't know if she has RA. She's like, I'm not sure. But her grandmother was in her 90s. And I thought, okay, that sucks. But she still lived her whole life. Right. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like she, like a, a long, long life. I think sometimes just seeing that other people do it takes away a lot of the other stuff. And I, I also think, Jenny, that understanding I don't think anybody gets out of this thing unscathed. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm a little, maybe we all are a little jaded because we know so many people with autoimmune diseases that it feels like everyone has an autoimmune disease some days. Right. And I'm sure there are some people walking around who are just free and clear and nothing's ever happened to them. But I think for the most part, that's not most people. So I don't think so either. I think most people have something that is not visible to others similar enough to mm. diabetes and the only outward visual in terms of diabetes truly are the devices right yeah. now the pumps and the cgms that are very visible to but even that doesn't disclose internally what the person has to go, go through, through yeah. and manage and take consideration of all day long mm -hmm. um so yes i in I loved your little boat and, you know, the news reporter and being yeah. like, hello, yeah. hello, something's coming, right? Because that is, I, oftentimes we, if you really are hoping too much, hope is a grand thing. It's it's wonderful. I, you know, we all have to hope for things, but along the way, we have to take action yeah. in order to get to that point of what we hoped for. Right. Um, you can't just sit back in the lawn chair and be like, well, if it comes to me, great, and I really hope that it does. Right. I, that's not not really going to. You got to work anywhere. towards it. Also, you have to work, yeah. if you've heard people on this podcast before who have multiple issues, and I'll say to them, if I gave you a magic wand and could make one of these go away, which one would it be? They almost never say diabetes. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. Like I always think, like, oh, they're definitely going to say diabetes. And they're always like, oh no, I would rather not have to deal with this. Or, and I think my point is, even if you have one thing going on in your life, and the guy across the street has one thing, and you think, oh, his thing's easier than my thing. If you had his thing in five minutes, you'd be like, damn it, how I'll do take I, my thing back. Yeah, I'll take <laughs> my thing back. Or how do I get rid of this now? Like nothing. I don't know. You know, it, this sucks. Don't get me wrong. And diabetes is relentless and it's 24 hours and et cetera. But there's a way to, there is a way to get through it and not, right. not have to live with all these feelings. And I think in the beginning, it's hard to imagine that's true, mm -hmm. but it really is. So, and I think something around it too, is actually opening up to the feelings in the beginning and letting yourself feel mm -hmm. all those things, you know, the stages yeah. of grief, really let yourself work through, through that don't turn it off right let yourself work through i feel really horrible could i have done something about it no i couldn't have changed this okay let's move on mm. but, right yeah. there's there's only so much that you can or you're gonna just feel bad forever right. and i don't want that for anybody there was a person here that i didn't get to that said every hospital should have a crying room 
just a soundproof room that you can go into with a chair and a box of tissues and you can just sit there and yes. let it out. And uh, A garage is a really nice place for that. <laughs> Jenny's, like, <laughs> Jenny's like, I yeah. scream in the garage in case you're wondering. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, thank you very much for doing this with of me. Of course. Thank absolutely. You. Good. Very good topic. Good. So. I'll talk to you soon. First, I'd like to thank Jenny Smith for coming on the show today and continuing to pour her great knowledge into this podcast. Don't forget, you can find Jenny at IntegratedDiabetes.com. And if this is the first Bold Beginnings episode you've heard, there's a whole series of it. You should go back and find them. Thanks so much to InPen from Medtronic Diabetes. Please go to InPenToday.com to get started. And of course, the Omnipod 5 is available at Omnipod.com forward slash juice box. I don't want to lie to you. I'm tired. This is my last editing job of the day, this episode. And uh, so for that reason, I'm not going to say anything else. Just thanks so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. I got to go to bed. <laughs>